So good evening. Uh, we'll be starting the sessions on Nelson-based discussion uh, from today onwards. Um, what we have planned is a set of uh, lecture series or discussion-based um, topics from Nelson textbook, which are like short topics, but important for your residencies as well as for uh, um, your entrance exams also. So that's what uh, is a, a reason behind starting the series. And we will have some meaningful discussion as we keep um, doing the topics um, so that it will help you in your residency and for your competitive exams also. So before we get started, you all must be knowing that uh, Maro has launched um, SS Pediatrics course a uh, few months back. And here we are trying to cover um, general aspects of pediatrics as well as the subspecialty topics also. And along with that videos, we are also providing QBanks and test series time to time um, as to help with your, um, your preparation and also to assess your preparations uh, uh, in between okay right so um, every aspect of pediatrics we have tried to cover um, so you can download the marrow app and can get started so with that we will start the topic which is about kawasaki disease again is there a, if there are any issues you can let us know in the chat box section and if you have any questions during the discussion please put it up in the q and a i'll be able to see them and we'll be able to reply to you so can we get started yeah okay so the first one about Kawasaki disease, the basic introduction. Uh, everything is based on Nelson textbook of pediatrics only. Nothing outside Nelson will, will be covered in this lecture series. So please do make a note of that. And all the guidelines based on Nelson only will be discussed here. And please make a special note of all these guidelines um, when I keep discussing because it is from these tables as well as the guidelines in Nelson from where questions are being directly picked up in the exams these days. Okay, right. So let us get started. Kawasaki disease is an important systemic inflammatory disorder which is characterized by vasculitis. Okay. And we all know that it's a vasculitis involving which type of blood vessel? Large, medium or small size blood vessel. It is definitely medium vessel vasculitis. And what is the importance? Which type of blood vessel is commonly affected in this condition? You all know about it. It is nothing but the coronary arteries which are affected. Coronary arteries which are affected. So that is why it has got direct cardiac implication and this makes the topic very important for exams as well. Okay, right. Next, we are going to discuss about uh, other names of this Kawasaki disease, which is also called mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. Okay, right. Why it is called uh, mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome? It is based on the manifestation where it involves the skin, mucosa, as well as the lymph nodes. We all know about it. We'll be discussing that in a while. Another name of this is also called as infantile PAN. What is that? Infantile polyarthritis nodosa. Okay, right. However, this name is now not used. Uh, another, the common name which is used is mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. That's what I have already written. Another name which was previously used was infantile polyarthritis nodosa. Okay, right. Then this condition is important as I already told you because of coronary artery abnormalities, especially it can lead on to aneurysms of the coronary arteries. And this is not a good thing to have because this aneurysm can further lead on to complications. Like in that aneurysm, thrombosis can develop, later stage stenosis can also develop, potentially resulting in myocardial ischemia infarction as well. So that is why this condition is something which is a very dreaded condition. Okay. And please make a note of this. Kawasaki disease is the most common childhood vasculitis in India. This is something which should be noted very clearly because the other childhood vasculitis which we all know about is henoch schonlein purpura Worldwide, henoch schonlein purpura is the most common childhood vasculitis, but in India, now it is Kawasaki disease, which is the most common one. Okay, right. Then, now this Kawasaki disease has also become the leading cause of acquired heart disease in children. Now, can any of you comment previously, what was the condition we say as the most common cause of acquired heart disease in children previously? Any answers? Previously. Which was the most common cause of acquired heart disease in children previously? It was rheumatic, okay, rheumatic heart disease, okay, rheumatic fever in childhood leading on to rheumatic heart disease was the most common cause of acquired heart disease. But now this 
Kawasaki disease is the leading cause of acquired heart disease in children. Okay, right. So this is something which you have to remember. Okay, very correct. Some of you have answered it correctly as well. Okay, right. Now, moving on to the next part, which is about etiology of Kawasaki disease. Any idea what is the etiology of Kawasaki disease? If you can just recollect few basic things. Kawasaki disease, the prime manifestation is fever. So that is why most of the people said it is an infectious etiology. Okay. In fact, there were some evidence to say that it's an infectious etiology because it can present like group of cases in a short period of time like that. So people thought that it may be an infection and that too fever, rash and all our features. So they said probably it is an infection. But till date, no proven infection has been identified in any case of Kawasaki disease. And there are reasons to say that it is not an infection also. Why? Because it is not something which will spread from one child to another something like that. So that is why people thought that it is not an infection also. So now this role of infection is not proven for Kawasaki disease. That is not the etiology. Then people started looking at the other possibilities and they have found out some genetic causation or genetic role involved in the causation of Kawasaki disease. And this is something which is going to be important for your exam purposes. Okay. Especially for a competitive exam, this can be asked. What is the first one? The first one is related to polymorphism in a gene called ITPKC gene. It may be a difficult gene to remember, but you have to remember one basic thing. What is the role of this ITPKC gene? It's a T cell regulator. It's a T cell regulator. So you can basically understand it is something related to inflammation. Okay, right? So possibility of this gene becoming defective and causing an uncontrolled inflammation and vasculitis in Kawasaki disease can be inferred. Okay. Second important, again for your MCQ purpose, is something called SNP. Okay. It's a polymorphisms in human leukocyte antigen class 2 region. That is HLA class 2. And here again, anything related to HLA is a potential question for your exam. Okay. And here some HLAs needs to be remembered. It is HLA DQ B2. This is something which is very important. I feel that it's a potential question. And second thing is HLA DOB region. Okay, right. So polymorphism, SNP is actually single nucleotide polymorphism in these HLA regions are supposed to be implied in the causation of this condition. So please make a note of this genetic role, potential MCQ for your exams. Okay. Now, if I ask you like a blank question, what could be the actual etiology of Kawasaki disease? Is it a known condition or an unknown etiology? Answer is just like any other vasculitis, Kawasaki disease is also unknown etiology or Nelson in the first line of etiology itself mentions like this. What is that? Cause of KD that is Kawasaki disease remains unknown. This is what you have to remember finally. Okay, right? So no, it is an idiopathic etiology, but genetic associations can be possible MCQs. That's what I want you to remember. Okay. Now, we move on to the epidemiological aspects of Kawasaki disease. Okay. Now, Kawasaki disease is a disease of young children. Okay. Can any of you comment? What is the age group in which Kawasaki disease cases are usually reported? Can any of you comment in which age group usually Kawasaki disease is reported? Which age group? You can comment your answers in the Q&A section or in the chat box. I will be able to see them. Yes. Very good. Okay. Very good. I see some of you answering very correctly. Please remember it is young children less than the age of five years. This is very important. Less than the age of five years. So you can understand that uh, this is a very, very important condition. Young age group children are going to be affected. And generally, more often it is seen in males compared to females. This is more of a statistical association. There is no specific reason for that. Okay. Then people started looking into how can we predict severity of this disease in a given child? Okay. As you can all infer from the name Kawasaki disease, you can infer that it was first described in Japan. And Japanese people, they have, uh, I mean, derived a sc score for predicting the severity. What is that score called? Koya Kobayashi. Okay. You can see that the name itself looks like a Japanese name. Okay. But there was a limitation of this Kobayashi score, wherein it was it is applicable only for Japanese children. It was not applicable for children all over the world. Okay. So is there any role of Kobayashi score at present? It is no because it is only limited to Japanese children. So now how are we able to say the predict, uh, predict the severity of this disease? It is based on measurement of coronary artery dimension. And how can you do that? 
yes quick question how can you do that coronary artery dimension how can you check for it of course it is by a echocardiography okay right very correct it is by two dimensional echocardiography this is important 2d echocardiography so if there is a question which investigation helps in prognosticating a child with kawasaki disease your answer has to be two dimensional echocardiography okay right so this is something which is a possible mcq question just a minute okay right so just make a note of it okay right so this is something related to the epidemiology now we move on to the clinical aspects of kawasaki disease and this is where as practicing pediatricians or as residents we should make a note of okay right features of kawasaki disease is something which is very important i have already told you the initial feature will be the fever okay right without any doubt it will be fever only okay and that is why most of us will think initially the possibilities for a infectious disease we may start the child on antibiotics we can start the child we can send blood culture but all of those investigation will come out to be negative because this is a non infectious condition and second point to be noted is fever is not of short duration can anybody comment typically what is the duration of fever in kawasaki disease when will you suspect yes when will you suspect kawasaki disease is it a one day two day fever or a long duration fever definitely it is long duration and by criteria we say that at least 5 days of fever more than or equal to 5 days of fever very important more than or equal to 5 days of fever and important important thing is it will not easily respond to antipyretics okay right not respond to antipyretics it will not respond to antibiotics also this is something which you have to definitely make a note of it okay right so that is when you will think that this may not be a typical infection associated condition okay so that is number one and this is the most essential criteria okay now other than fever yes very correct yes very correct it's a long duration fever okay right other than fever what are the other uh, features of kawasaki disease okay right let us quickly see this picture and the first picture okay please have a look at this one what is that picture depicting the very classical picture of redness of the eyes or what is conjunctivitis okay right conjunctivitis now here also you should make some special note of this conjunctivitis we have studied in so many um, infections okay right how do you differentiate conjunctivitis in kawasaki disease from other conditions that's what you have to answer yes the clue is it's a non infectious condition so it's a non purulent conjunctivitis correct you won't see pus associated with conjunctivitis only redness of the eyes will be noted so one of course is very clear it is non purulent any other finding any other finding you can comment your answers in the q and a section very good most of you were able to say very correct yes some of you even said the other one very very important which area of the eye will will not be affected limbus will be spared limbal sparing this is very important the limbus will be spared so keep a note of this these are all essential points limbal sparing okay right so in a child you have to look for all these things okay right non purulent or non exudative and one more is limbal sparing will be present that is characteristic of conjunctivitis then third is again i'm going back to the pictures and comment on this one what are you seeing in all these areas in this hands and the feet and all it's nothing but the rash it is nothing but the rash again what is the condition rash is commonly seen in many infectious condition how do you characterize um, the rash in kawasaki disease is there any specific characteristic of rash in kawasaki disease any of you can comment it is there any specific characteristic of rash in kawasaki disease any comment i'm just looking at your comments only yes can anybody comment is there any characteristic of rash in kawasaki disease unfortunately the answer is no because the rash can take multiple forms can you see what i have put up it can be the usual maculopapular rash it can be a erythema multiform type of rash or it can be a scarlatid form rash also okay right there is no specific characteristic and because this rash can take multiple uh, i mean multiple forms this is also called polymorphic rash very important okay right polymorphic rash now one more practical tip which you can remember is this rash is never vesicular or bullous this is very important okay 
you will not get a vesicular rash or a bullous rash. This is a practically helpful point. Okay, right? Very correct. Very correct. Never vesicular or bullous. And one more important feature would be lymphadenopathy, right? And lymphadenopathy usually in this condition is which area? Yes, I think most of you know that also. It's usually in the cervical region. Cervical region. Again, is there any other characteristic for lymphadenopathy? Anybody wants to comment? Any other characteristic for lymphadenopathy? Yeah, it's usually a single lymph node. Very correct. And this is also asked uh, sometimes in your clinical rounds as well as in your MCQ questions also. It's a large lymphadenopathy. This number is very important. More than 1.5 centimeter in size. Please make a note of this. It should be a single cervical lymphadenopathy more than 1.5 centimeter in size. Okay, right. Fine. Okay, then I think the other finding all of you can say from this picture. What is this picture depicting? The oral lesion, nothing but erythema, erythema or redness of the lips as well as the tongue. And you all know about it. The characteristic name for that um, tongue involvement is what? Yes, very correct. It's bright reddish called as a strawberry tongue. Okay, right. Strawberry tongue. Okay, right. These are some of the main features of Kawasaki disease. Of course, not to forget you can have edema of the limbs also. You can have edema in the limbs also. Okay, fine. Edema in the limbs also. Now, can any of you tell any other feature of Kawasaki disease, which I have not told till now? Any of you can tell? Yes, any other feature of Kawasaki disease, which I have not yet mentioned till now. Okay, look at this picture and tell me what is this picture about? Quick question, what is this picture about? Any answers? Very correct. It is nothing but the, yeah, some of you are saying the other features. I am asking this particular picture. Very good. It is nothing but the desquamation. Where it is noted, it is around the fingernails, which is periangual desquamation. Okay, right. But only one thing I want you to remember very clearly. Periangual desquamation is one of the characteristic features of Kawasaki disease. But only thing, it will not appear in the initial week of illness. Okay, it will not appear in the first week. Usually in the second or in the third week is when periangual desquamation is noted in case of Kawasaki disease. So please make a note of this. Only in the second or third week of illness. Okay. Now talking about desquamation, desquamation can also be seen in the perianal region as well as in the perineal region also. Okay, right. It can be noted in perianal and the perianal region also. Okay. But periangual desquamation characteristically in the second or the third week of illness. Okay, right. This should be remembered clearly. Okay, right. Now, coming to the next thing. Okay. Suppose I ask you, these are all like obvious external manifestations of Kawasaki disease. Okay. But which is the most important manifestation of Kawasaki disease? If I ask you, your answer has to be which is the most important manifestation of Kawasaki disease, which you are all worried about in a child with Kawasaki disease. Yes, it is nothing but the cardiac manifestation. This is something which you have to remember. Of course, yes. Cardiac manifestations, please remember. Um, just a minute. Okay, it's a cardiac manifestation. Cardiac manifestation can occur during the acute phase of uh, illness of Kawasaki disease. Cardiac problems can also occur as complications in later stage also, right? Okay, and the initial cardiac manifestation will be in the form of tachycardia. That's what I have mentioned. Almost 50% of the patients will have this tachycardia only. And can anybody tell me um, what is this uh, manifestation due to tachycardia commonly? Can anybody tell this? Some of you have already answered. Yes, very correct. What is that? It is nothing but due to myocarditis. Please make a note of this. It is myocarditis. It is myocarditis. Okay, right. Fine. So, if somebody asks you the question, during the acute Kawasaki disease, okay, right, if cardiac feature is noted, what is the most common cardiac manifestation? It is myocarditis manifesting as tachycardia. Some of you are answering coronary aneurysm. Of course, very correct. Coronary aneurysm is correct. But coronary aneurysms are more of a complication of Kawasaki disease. They are not acute manifestations of Kawasaki disease. This is what you have to remember. Okay, right. Fine. Now, talking about tachycardia, one more point is also there. What is that? Tachycardia can occur due to fever also, right? Kawasaki disease will have fever. Then how will you say that this tachycardia is probably due to myocarditis and not only due to fever? 
can anybody answer this how can you say the, very good that was the answer i was looking about see we all know that i think it's a rough number we teach in the clinic center what is it for every one degree rise in temperature that means when there is a fever there's a rise in temperature for every one degree rise in temperature how much will be the increase in the heart rate can anybody tell me it's a clinical question for every one degree rise in the temperature how much is the increase in the heart rate very good roughly 10 to 15 beats per minute extra will be noted okay increase in the heart rate will be more than like uh, 10 to 15 compared to the normal heart rate that is what we all learn about but here it would be something like 20 to 30 more than the normal heart rate or it is something which is disproportionate to the fever very important it is disproportionate increase in the heart rate when compared to the fever okay that is what you have to remember disproportionate to fever okay this is the keyword which i want you to make a note of okay fine so that is what it is tachycardia okay then are there any other manifestations cardiac manifestations of kawasaki disease during the acute stage any other manifestation of course you can have one will be related to the pericardial involvement okay pericardial involvement because just like myocarditis you can also have pericarditis also you can even hear a friction rub while you auscultate these children or there can also be sometimes pericardial effusion also causing muffling of the heart sounds all those things can be noted right so pericardial involvement can also be noted okay and one more important important point is suppose kawasaki disease is a severe uh, variety in that particular child it can directly affect the functioning of the heart and resulting in decreased left ventricular function which can be noted on echocardiography also during the acute stage and whenever there is a decrease lv function you have to think that it's a severe form of kawasaki disease manifesting in that child okay this is what you have to remember okay and even worse condition can occur what is the worst form of cardiac involvement in kawasaki disease it can even lead on to shock manifestations also like cardiogenic shock can occur and this presentation of kawasaki disease with shock is what we call kd shock syndrome this is a word mentioned in nelson also obviously the most severe cardiac manifestation of kawasaki disease during the acute stage are you able to follow this right so all these are different forms of cardiac manifestations okay fine now there is one more variant of kawasaki disease also called node first kawasaki disease this is also mentioned in nelson textbook of pediatrics wherein children will present with fever and lymphadenopathy alone okay so the initial manifestation will be fever and lymphadenopathy so again most of us will think that it's a infection related condition only but the point is what i have said already what is that this fever will not be responding to the usual antibiotics or antibiotics and second thing as the days go by other manifestations of kawasaki disease will also start manifesting okay so that is why this variant of kawasaki disease is called node first kawasaki disease this variant is called node first kawasaki disease okay right so these are the different manifestations of kawasaki disease which i want you to remember about okay so when a child is presenting to the hospital with kawasaki disease you can have uh, these manifestations which i have discussed okay but let me ask you one more question suppose we have a child with suspected kawasaki disease in the ward do you find all the manifestation at the time of presentation itself please answer that will you find all manifestations of kawasaki disease at the time of presentation itself no it is not possible that is what i want you to remember that is why always always clinical suspicion should be the number one thing for a kawasaki disease why because all the manifestation will evolve over a period of time maybe first day or second day third day child may be having only fever then rash will start appearing limbs will start becoming edematous maybe fifth day child can start having this conjunctivitis as well as the lymphadenopathy so the thing is you have to suspect kawasaki disease and when the features start appearing one after another then only you can confirm your diagnosis of kawasaki disease and please make a note of this for your exam purposes that kawasaki disease follows something called three stages okay acute stage subacute stage and convalescent of the recovery stage acute stage is the first one to two weeks of illness and this is where the fever and the other manifestations occur okay and the other manifestations of kawasaki disease is characteristically remembered by this mnemonic cream you all know about it okay right it's a very famous mnemonic there's nothing but the manifestation i have told only what is that c for conjunctivitis r for the rash e for um, extremity that is the edema of the extremities 
A for adenopathy, M is for the mucosal changes, which is nothing but the redness of the lips and the strawberry tongue, all those things, okay? So in the first two weeks, this is what you will be seeing, okay, right. Now, you can see this picture also. Can you see that? The acute manifestations of Kawasaki disease. Can you see? Fever is there. Sometimes arthritis can be there, but it's not usual manifestation. Then you can have cardiovascular manifestation. What is written? Myocarditis. Don't forget. In the acute stage, it is myocarditis. Can you see? In the subacute stage only, it is aneurysms. Don't forget that. Okay. Then, of course, skin. You can see the redness. That is a erythema rash of the palms and soles can be noted. And can you see? Desquamation is noted only in the subacute stage. That is what I was telling you. Periangual desquamation is usually noted in the subacute stage. Can you see the other manifestation? Conjunctival involvement in the acute stage only. Lymphadenopathy in the acute stage only. So can you see whatever manifestations I have told you are commonly present in the acute stage of Kawasaki disease. Okay, right. Now, next thing you have to tell me, how will we make a clinical diagnosis of uh, Kawasaki disease? Please remember, in Kawasaki disease, earlier you make the diagnosis, better is the outcome. Because early diagnosis and treatment will help to decrease the rate of complications in Kawasaki disease. So now tell me, out of this fever and other manifestation, how many should be present? It's a very standard question. Maybe when you're preparing for your PG entrance exams itself, you must have learned this. What is that? Okay. I'm asking you, what is a clinical diagnosis criteria? Okay. Very correct. Some of you are answering correctly. The must-have feature is fever. Fever persisting for at least five days. Very important. And I already told you, not responding to antibiotics or antibiotics. Then, other criteria is the cream criteria. Cream means you can see that there are five features. And out of that five, at least four should be present. At least four should be present. Very important. Out of that cream, at least four should be present. Okay, fine. Then, along with that, you have to exclude the other diseases with similar findings. Okay. What would be this category of diseases with similar findings? Most of them would be coming under the infections. Okay, right? And uh, I will be asking you a question. What are the, I mean, uh, common infections which can be mistaken for Kawasaki disease? Little shortly. At that time, we will try to differentiate how will we differentiate it from a Kawasaki disease. Okay, so the baseline is this one. During acute stage, you have to make the diagnosis with fever and four out of uh, five features in the cream pneumonia, you have to remember. Okay, right. Then the next stage is the subacute stage. This is the most dangerous stage. This is the most dangerous stage. Why? This is the stage when complications of Kawasaki disease will occur and especially aneurysms. I've already put up in the picture. Aneurysm is very common in the subacute stage. So that is why, can you see that in the acute stage itself, if you can make a diagnosis, we can make the child to directly go into which stage. Suppose diagnosis made in the acute stage and then treatment is also started. Okay. We can directly make the child to go into convalescence or recovery stage. Or in other words, we can try to decrease the incidence of complications. Okay. Right. Fine. So subacute stage is characterized by aneurysm formation. Okay. That is fine. Any other feature of subacute stage? I have put up in the picture also. Quickly recollect. What was that? It was desquamation also. Don't forget. It is desquamation also. Of course, I am talking about periangual desquamation. And is there any other feature of a subacute stage which you have noted in that picture I shared? This picture? See this one. Thrombocytosis is more marked in the subacute stage. Okay, there will be increase in the platelet count in the subacute stage. Okay, this is also an important, important thing. Increase in the platelet count. Okay. Please remember this point. Platelet count is usually normal in the first week or the acute stage. But once the child goes into the subacute stage, it becomes increased. This is what you have to remember. Convalescent is, of course, recovery only where all the manifestation will start subsiding. Okay. And one thing which can be a potential question in your exams. What is written is in convalescent stage, there can be nail changes, nail changes. Anybody want to comment on what is a nail change? which I am talking about in the convalescent stage. Yes. Anybody? What is a nail change in the convalescent stage? I will give you the clue. It is not specific for Kawasaki disease and all. Child having any major illness and when the child is recovering from that illness, you can see this nail change. I can also tell you like this. Suppose you had a child admitted in the ICU due to some 
dangerous disease like a septic shock or something like that. And the child was fortunately recovering after some time. And maybe during follow-up, you are seeing that child. You can see this nail change. So the bottom line is this one. This nail change can be seen in any child recovering from a severe illness. Peeling. Okay. Very good. They are... Yeah, you got it correct. This is something called as a, one minute, just a minute. This is something called as Buse line. This is called as a Buse line. I don't have the picture here, but you can understand that if you look at the nail, there will be something like a transverse or a horizontal ridge will be noted. That is what is called as a Buse line, which can be noted in the recovery uh, stage of Kawasaki disease. Okay, right. So this picture, is something which is very, very important for your exam. And it tells you so many important clues in Kawasaki disease as well as when you're preparing for your exams. Please make sure you know this picture by heart. Okay, right? And this is nothing but the text version of whatever I have put up in that picture. Okay? I hope you're able to follow this. Please remember, Kawasaki disease is more of a clinical diagnosis. And very, very important, you have to make a diagnosis in the acute stage. That is the first two weeks itself. And most of the, and even Nelson textbook, tells like that. If the diagnosis is made within first 10 days of illness itself, there is a great decrease in the incidence of coronary aneurysms which are occurring in the subacute phase only, right? So, this is the bottom line which you have to remember. Okay, right. Now, I have told you the classical or the usual manifestations of Kawasaki disease. Now, let us just quickly see what are the other unusual manifestations of Kawasaki disease which as uh, physicians we should keep in mind because sometimes those can be the presenting features. It may be like unusual or atypical features, but still you have to keep them in your mind. This is what I saw as some of your answers when I was asking about features of Kawasaki disease. Uh, I'll just quickly mention all those manifestations. Okay. One could be something like this. What if I tell you that this is the uh, arm area of the child? This is the arm area of the child. And I am seeing this manifestation. What is that? Okay. It is the area of BCG scar which has now become reactivated. BCG scar reactivation. That is what you are seeing in this particular um, picture. Okay. BCG scar reactivation. Okay. Any other features? Okay. One more with the perianal desquamation. I have already mentioned that previously also. Perianal desquamation, perianal desquamation, all can be manifestations of Kawasaki disease. Then they can have aseptic meningitis. Aseptic meningitis is nothing but a part of inflammatory response to Kawasaki disease. That's it. Nothing's very special. It's a part of inflammatory response to Kawasaki disease. That is what. Okay, right. Same inflammation can cause high drops of the gallbladder also, which can be noted on the ultrasound. Okay. We have seen a good number of cases characterized by when we do the investigation, there is high drops of the gallbladder also. So I'll put a star. This is one of the important manifestations also which you have to keep in mind. Clinically, we come across. That is why. Okay. Then what it can happen, then what can happen is something like inflammation. Urethritis can happen. Urethritis can happen, but it's not an infection-related urethritis, inflammatory urethritis. So what can manifestation? The manifestation is sterile pyuria. That means you can see pus cells on urine examination, but culture will be sterile. That is what is the meaning of sterile pyuria. Then, okay. Comment on this one. This is nothing but the perianal desquamation, which can be noted in Kawasaki disease. Okay. So these are the other manifestations which are not included in the actual criteria, but should be kept in mind whenever we discuss about or see a child with Kawasaki disease. These are the other possible manifestations. Okay. Fine. So now we have covered the clinical aspects of Kawasaki disease. Okay. Bottom line is this one. Initially, Kawasaki disease looks like an infection, but please try to differentiate it based on the additional findings. Okay. And all the additional findings will not occur at the time of presentation itself. It will occur over a period of time. So that is why clinical suspicion is must for diagnosing Kawasaki disease. Okay. Next, we move on to lab investigation. Actually speaking, lab investigations are not characteristic of Kawasaki disease. Lab investigations are a reflection of an inflammatory process only. That's all. We cannot diagnose lab, uh, I mean, Kawasaki disease based on lab investigation. That is the point I wanted to tell you. Okay. Now, quickly comment. What will happen to WBC count? Simple question. What will happen to WBC count? What will happen to WBC count? Yes, it is going to be elevated. It will be increased. As a part of inflammatory response, WBC count will be increased. Okay, fine. What will happen to the platelet count? I have already told you. It is normal in the first week. However, in the subacute stage, 
that the second or third week it will be increased that is what i was talking about okay in subacute stage it will be increased okay right not to forget okay right then what about esr and crp of course they will be elevated only as a part of inflammatory response okay right okay now one important important uh, clue which is mentioned in nelson textbook of pediatrics is kawasaki disease is unlikely if esr crp and platelet count remain normal after seven days of fever very very important clinical clue okay so you are seeing a child who is having who is running fever for 10 days but surprisingly esr crp platelet count everything is normal don't even consider kawasaki disease this is a clinical key which i want you to make a note of okay right so this is something very important prominently mentioned in nelson textbook of pediatrics okay right so just make a note of it uh, lab investigation will not help in your diagnosis but if all the counts and esr crp are normal after 7 days of fever don't think about kawasaki disease that's what is the bottom line okay then if at all there is an investigation which can help me with prognosticating a child with kawasaki disease what would be that investigation i will again repeat my question tell me the investigation which will help to tell the prognosis in a child with kawasaki disease prognosis in a child with kawasaki disease it is none other than two dimensional echocardiography without any doubt it is two dimensional echo only which will help me to prognosticate a child with kawasaki disease okay right and this is given by american heart association guidelines in 2017 where they have given nothing but coronary artery dimensions coronary artery dimension adjusted for the body surface area bsa is body surface area okay right now this is what is important for your exams also even clinically also this is what helps in the prognosis okay and based on the size of the coronary artery we can give some terms can you see that no involvement means a size which is less than 2 z score very important wording please make a note of this less than 2 z score okay right that is what you have to remember then what is the meaning of dilatation only dilatation only means it is something like 2 to 2.5 less than 2.5 i am sorry 2 to less than 2.5 is what is called dilatation or it is also called ectasia i think you can understand that word ectasia means nothing but dilatation only correct okay right then small aneurysm this now it is a classification for aneurysm what is that more than or equal to 2.5 to less than 5 z score remember all in terms of z score only we are talking about okay fine then medium sized aneurysm is obviously more than or equal to 5 to less than 10 z score that is what is the meaning of medium aneurysm large or giant aneurysm this is something important large or giant aneurysm is more than or equal to 10 z score or we can also define large aneurysm by an absolute dimension of more than or equal to 8 mm and this is something which i feel is very important for your exams also why because large or giant aneurysm is associated with increased risk of future complications can anybody tell me what future complications can develop suppose i have a child who is having a large or a giant aneurysm um, diagnosed on echocardiography what could be the future risk in that child i should be aware of that risk because uh, i have to plan some management based on that can anybody tell me what would be the future risk for a giant or a large aneurysm of course the caliber of the coronary artery is getting affected so in future it can even be associated with what stenosis of the artery leading on to ischemia and infarction it can also predispose to acute coronary thrombosis also this is the risk i have to be careful about whenever i see a child who is having large or a giant aneurysm okay right just a minute okay so can you note this one so the question will be like this which investigation helps in prognosis of a child with kawasaki disease it is two dimensional echocardiography and what type of aneurysm is associated with increased risk of future complication it is a large or giant aneurysms characterized by z score of more than or equal to 10 or absolute dimension more than or equal to 8 mm this is what i want you to remember are you able to follow this right okay right now coming to the next part echocardiography is fine but when should i do the echocardiography this is something like a guideline only there is no reason for me to 
uh, or I cannot explain this one. These are all based on the guidelines given in Nelson textbook. What is that? Every child with Kawasaki disease, once you made a clinical diagnosis, at the time of diagnosis itself, you have to do a baseline echocardiography. Of course, it's very unlikely that in the first week of illness, you will see any changes, but at least some dilatations may be noted. That is what. So at the time of diagnosis, you have to do the echocardiography. Then when is the next thing? Uh, when is the next time we will do the echocardiography? The second is one to two week uh, of illness you have to do because the child is going in towards the subacute stage. Then third is like six to eight weeks. Why six to eight weeks is something like this. Six to eight weeks generally marks the recovery time in Kawasaki disease. So probably at that time also, you may have to do this. Six to eight weeks. And then after one year of illness, you have to do okay something like a follow-up only. And then Nelson textbook mentions that every five years, you have to do a cardiology consult. And then if needed, you have to do echocardiography also. Okay, right. This is what is the timeline for doing echocardiography. So please keep a note of this. This can be asked in your exams as well. What is the timeline for doing echocardiography? Now, see, these are all the timelines. If every time the echo is normal, this is what you're going to follow. Suppose at any point of this time, so for, for example, one to two weeks or six to eight weeks, any time, if echo is abnormal, then what the guidelines say, you have to do frequent echocardiographic monitoring. And this is left to the treating physician or the cardiologist. They will do frequent monitoring. Okay. Every time when the echo is normal, the first one I have written will be applicable. But any point of time, the echo becomes abnormal, then you have to do frequent monitoring. This is what is related to the echocardiographic, uh, I mean, monitoring in a child with Kawasaki disease, the most, most important investigation. Okay, right. Okay. Now, one more thing I want you to make a note of is regarding differential diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. This is something important. Okay. Diagnosis is clinical only. Lab investigation, not helpful, but echocardiography for prognosis, it is important. That is what I have told you till now. Now, tell me what are the differentials you will consider whenever you are dealing with a Kawasaki disease? Of course, of course, it's all about infections only, right? So can anybody tell me what all viral infections can be the differentials for Kawasaki disease? I think this is a very famous question also. Viral infections, which are um, differentials for Kawasaki disease. Any comment? Viral infections. See, there can be many viral infections which can have different features of Kawasaki disease, but two important things, at least clinically, for us, uh, for our discussion purpose also, you should know about is, one is adenoviral infection, one more is measles infection. Okay, fine. Now, let us discuss how to differentiate it clinically. Okay, yeah, very good, very good. Most of you are saying the answers, but first you tell me, adenoviral infection, how can it be differentiated from a usual Kawasaki disease? Any answer? Adenoviral infection can have conjunctivitis, but it would be exudative conjunctivitis. Very important, exudative conjunctivitis. Whereas in Kawasaki disease, it is non-exudative conjunctivitis. So this is a key feature. An adenoviral infection, you can also have pharyngitis as well. Exudative pharyngitis, which is typically not noted in Kawasaki disease. Okay, that is one way of differentiating between adenoviral infections and uh, a Kawasaki disease. How about measles? See, measles is just only for the purpose of discussion I am taking into account. Nowadays, we don't see many cases of measles because it's vaccine preventable. And number two, measles, I think clinical diagnosis, most of you should be able to tell me. What is that? The typical, what is that? Yeah, they are also conjunctivitis. Of course, exudative conjunctivitis without any doubt, exudative conjunctivitis. Anything else? The typical rash of measles. What is the typical rash of measles? We all know about it maclopapular rash which starts in the face from behind the ears and then spread downwards okay right and it starts only from the day four of illness okay right which is not going to be seen in case of kawasaki disease and that is how we can differentiate this measles rash from kawasaki disease rash and of course what is the enanthem seen in the measles inside the oral mucosa buccal mucosa what is that it's a complex spots which are never going to be seen in case of kawasaki disease so that is how we can differentiate measles from kawasaki disease then we move on to the bacterial infection. 
And when I say bacterial infection, that's what most of you have commented also. The number one condition will be scarlet fever. Typically in scarlet fever, you have fever, you have rash, you also have strawberry tongue. Very correct, right? So then how will you differentiate scarlet fever from Kawasaki disease? Any comment? Scarlet fever from Kawasaki disease. This I think is a clinical question which most of you might have come across uh, maybe in your uh, clinical rotations when you see a case of Kawasaki disease. Usually your uh, <coughs> consultants will ask this question. How do you differentiate scarlet fever from Kawasaki disease? Remember fever, rash as well as the uh, strawberry tongue are all characteristic features. Okay, right? Seen in both Kawasaki and uh, scarlet fever. How will you differentiate it? Yes, scarlet fever, please make a note of it. There will be a prompt response to antibiotic. Very, very important. Prompt response to antibiotics. Very important. Within 48 to 72 hours of starting antibiotic, the fever will subside in case of scarlet fever, whereas it will never go into subside in case of Kawasaki disease. This is the clinically important point which you should remember. Second important thing is in scarlet fever, ocular features that is a conjunctivitis and all is usually not seen. Whereas it is prominently noted in case of Kawasaki disease. Okay. I hope you're able to understand that this is very important. So I'm putting a star here for the scarlet fever, which is often asked in the exam. Then one more, which may be relevant for our Indian population is leptospirosis. You all know about it. Uh, leptospirosis can have some features of Kawasaki disease, especially leptospirosis. Uh, why do you think I'm telling in terms of Kawasaki disease? Leptospirosis, prolonged fever. Very correct. Leptospirosis, prolonged fever. Very correct. Okay, right. However, leptospirosis will typically have a biphasic illness. Very important. Biphasic illness. How is that usually happening? Any comments? Biphasic illness. Initially, there will be fever. Along with that, intense headache will be noted. After that, what happens is that there will be a afebrile phase for few days, which is never going to occur in Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease will be continuous fever only, but in leptospirosis, after the initial fever, there will be few days of afebrile period and then you will have this very, uh, I mean, dangerous manifestation. What is that? Hepatic plus renal failure will occur. Hepatic plus renal failure will occur. That's what you have to remember. Hepatic plus renal failure will occur. That is how you'll differentiate its leptospirosis and not any other um, Kawasaki disease-like presentation. Okay, right. So these are the infections-related differentials for Kawasaki disease. Then, can any of you think of any rheumatological disorder which will have some features of Kawasaki disease? Always remember, um, uh, not all rheumatological features, but many rheumatological uh, disorders will have rash as one of the characteristic features. Some of them can even have fever, okay? And even arthritis also because Kawasaki disease rarely has been associated with arthritis also. So can any of you think of a rheumatological disorder as a differential for Kawasaki? Um, no, you're talking about complications of rheumatological disorders. I'm not asking about that. The name of a rheumatological disorder itself. Okay, what is this one? S-O-J-I-A. What is that? Systemic onset. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Correct? Yeah, correct. So, systemic onset, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. That will have typically fever. That will have a rash also. And that fever also will be for a longer period of time. That fever will also be for a longer period of time. But what is the differentiating feature? Can anybody tell me what is the differentiating feature for uh, differentiating this uh, systemic onset JA from Kawasaki disease? I will give you the clue. You try to attempt it. Lymphadenopathy is one of the differentiating features. What is that? Why lymphadenopathy is a differentiating feature? In Kawasaki disease also, you have lymphadenopathy, right? Recall the point. What is that? Kawasaki disease, it's a single cervical lymphadenopathy. Whereas in systemic onset JA, it will be diffuse lymph node enlargement. Okay, I'm writing in short form. Diffuse LNE. What is that? Diffuse lymph node enlargement. That is number one point. And number two point is that there will be additionally splenomegaly. There will be additionally splenomegaly and many cases of so systemic onset JA, you will also have a lab investigation. What is that? Elevated serum ferritin also can be noted. Hyperferritinemia can also be noted in many cases. Okay. This is how we can try to differentiate Kawasaki disease from some other conditions. Okay. Right. So this slide is something going to be important for your exams. Even clinically also, this is very, very important because I 
repeating it again and again but still it is important that is why kawasaki disease all the features may not be present at the time of uh, i mean child presenting to the hospital so that's why we have to consider differentials and as the features keep on accumulating you can make a clinical diagnosis of kawasaki disease okay right fine so till now what i have discussed is about a typical case of kawasaki disease and how to differentiate it from other condition mimicking the kawasaki disease now we can have one more situation also called by this what is that uh, a child having fever for long duration but not having four out of five in the cream mnemonic okay what will you call that fever is present but not four out of five features are present but still you are thinking about sorry thinking about the possibility of kawasaki disease what is that it is something called as incomplete kawasaki disease also called a typical kawasaki disease okay and can you see this what is very clearly written child having five days of fever or oh, and two or three compatible clinical criteria remember for a typical kawasaki disease you should have uh, at least four out of five clinical criteria but in case of incomplete kawasaki disease it's only two out of two or three in the clinical criteria that's what you have to make a note of okay right yes now this is what is called incomplete kawasaki disease Another way of saying incomplete Kawasaki disease, this is from Nelson, clearly they have mentioned it. What is that? Infants having fever for more than seven days without an obvious source for that fever. Think of something like PUO, pyrexia of unknown origin. In all infants also, you have to suspect Kawasaki disease because what they have found out is in infancy, fever is the prominent manifestation. All the other manifestation can occur little late. So that is why they are saying that any infant having fever for more than seven days without any other appropriate explanation or any other focus of infection, think about Kawasaki disease. This is going to be your MCQ part or a competitive exam topic. How will you evaluate this child with incomplete Kawasaki disease? Can you see the first one written? You have to depend on lab investigation. What did I tell you previously? Lab investigation will not help in the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease, I told you. But here, in uh, to bring in the possibility of Kawasaki disease, we have to depend on lab investigation and that too, what are the two investigation? ESR and CRP. Of course, what I'm expecting, elevated ESR and CRP, which is what you are seeing on the right side. CRP more than 3 and ESR more than 40. It means there is a definite inflammation. I can think about Kawasaki disease. Look at the other side. What is that? If the ESR is less and CRP is less, it is unlikely to be Kawasaki disease. That's why they have mentioned reassess like that. Okay, right. Okay, now let us look at the other side. What is that? Uh, a typical Kawasaki disease, but elevated ESR and CRP. Here, I cannot straight away call it as Kawasaki disease. I have to look at other investigations also. Can you see the other investigation? Can you see that? I'm just enlarging it. You can see here what is written. Three or more of the other lab findings. Anemia. Okay, platelet count elevated, but see what is the time of illness? After one week of illness. That is after the seventh day, low serum albumin. Elevated ALT level, it is something like a reflection of hepatitis as a part of inflammation occurring in Kawasaki disease. WBC count elevated, that's also occurring in inflammation. And urine more than 10 WBC per high power field. Can anybody tell me what is that one? Urine more than 10, mm, more than 10 WBC per high power field. Any comments? More than 10 uh, WBC per high power field. It is nothing but sterile pyuria, which can also be one of the manifestations of Kawasaki disease. So very simple. If you are suspecting incomplete Kawasaki disease, depend on lab investigation. Or one more is also written. What is that? Positive echocardiography. Don't forget this. Echocardiography. So in addition to lab investigation, you can also do echocardiography. Okay. So multiple lab investigation are suggesting inflammation or echocardiography is positive. Okay. Then you can go ahead and treat as a case of Kawasaki disease. Okay. I hope you are able to understand this one. I'll just quickly recollect it one more time for all of you as a, just a minute. I will just quickly recollect it one more time. Typical case of Kawasaki disease will be diagnosed based on clinical features. That is fever along with four out of five in the cream mnemonic. That's what will be for typical Kawasaki disease. And in a typical Kawasaki disease, echocardiography will help in prognosis. Lab investigations are not going to any way help in the diagnosis. But when you come to incomplete Kawasaki disease, Lab investigation should be done and the initial suspicion will be based on elevated ESR and elevated CRP. And if that is the case, then you have to do other investigations also to look for evidence of inflammation. If that is positive, you can treat as Kawasaki disease. 
or if investigations are not suggestive but echocardiography is suggestive then also you have to treat it as a case of Kawasaki disease. I hope you are able to follow this typical and incomplete or atypical Kawasaki disease. I hope you are able to follow this. Now we move on to our last part of discussion which is going to be regarding treatment of Kawasaki disease. Okay. Treatment in the acute stage. That is the first one. Okay. And you all know what is the initial drug which we will give? It is always, always intravenous immunoglobulin. IVIG is supposed to be the treatment of choice in case of Kawasaki disease. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, can anybody tell me, uh, see, this is something which is very important. At a pediatric residency level, you are supposed to know the dose of IVIG also. Can any of you tell if you have used uh, or maybe you have seen a child with Kawasaki disease being treated, you can tell me the dose. This is important. That is why I'm asking you the question. Any dose of IVIG, can any of you tell? Okay, it is something like grams per kilogram. Know it correctly. It is 2 grams per kg. Okay, that would be the dose given as intravenous infusion over 10 to 12 hours. This is important. Okay, right. This is the initial treatment which we will give for a child with Kawasaki disease. Okay, and please remember what is the uh, incidence of uh, coronary artery abnormality, CAAM rating, coronary artery abnormalities in Kawasaki disease. Can any of you tell what is the incidence of coronary artery abnormality? Kawasaki in, uh, sorry, coronary artery abnormalities in Kawasaki disease, it is in the range of 20 to 25 percentage, which is a big number. However, if you give IVIG, do you know how much is the incidence of coronary artery abnormalities? Any answer? It will be less than 5 percentage. So, can you see there is a drastic reduction of coronary artery abnormalities by giving IVIG? This is an important, important point. And Nelson textbook clearly mentioned that this effect of IVIG is more pronounced if the treatment is started within 10 days of illness. This is what Nelson very clearly mentions. So this also underlines the importance that we have to make the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease in the early stage itself so that you can decrease the incidence of coronary artery abnormalities. Not only that, you can also prevent the child from going into the subacute phase and developing coronary aneurysm. That's what you should remember. So IVIG is the initial treatment. Then next is about aspirin. What is the role of aspirin? What is the role of aspirin? It is not for anti-platelet effect we are using in the acute stage. What is the use? It is for anti-inflammatory effect we are using the aspirin. And you all know about this. Whenever it is anti-inflammatory dose, it will be a low dose or a high dose. It's always going to be higher doses only. And two type of doses is given in Nelson. Okay. One moderate dose. One more is a high dose. Moderate dose is something like this. 30 to 50 mg per kg per day. 40 to 50 mg per kg per day. But commonly what is used in the ward is a high dose only. How much is the high dose? 80 to 100 mg per kg per day. Of course. You will give it in divided doses only, but total dose is 80 to 100 mg per kg per day. And can any of you tell me till what time I have to give this aspirin in the anti-inflammatory dose? Any comments? Aspirin in anti-inflammatory dose. Any comment? Very good. Very good. Yes, anti-inflammatory dose. Okay. See, this is basically inflammation only. So what is that? Until the child becomes afebrile. That's how we can clinically say and guidelines say like this. Until the child is afebrile for at least 48 hours. Till that time, I have to give the uh, aspirin. Okay. So, remember IVIG single infusion. Aspirin in anti-inflammatory doses will be the cornerstone of treatment in acute stage of Kawasaki disease. That is fine. Okay, suppose I have a child with Kawasaki disease and I'm asking you one question. Can steroids be useful in the management of Kawasaki disease? What is your answer? Comment about the role of steroid in Kawasaki disease. Any comments? Comment about the role of steroid. It's a very important question. Clinically also, they may ask you. One minute. Okay. Yes. Is there a role of steroid? Okay. See, previously... Steroids have been used in the treatment of Kawasaki disease. In fact, there are multiple, I mean, um, multiple studies also telling you the role of Kawasaki disease uh, being treated with steroid also. 
and some studies say that steroids are not helpful also okay right? so there are conflicting evidences for steroid in kawasaki disease but what is the final thing which you have to keep in mind as a pediatric resident okay this is what nelson says see here despising despite these promising results administration of steroids as primary treatment to all children with kawasaki disease avoids development of the risk score that identifies high risk children in a multiracial population okay that means till now the role of steroids is not clear and they are not routinely used in the management of kawasaki disease that is the point which you all have to remember steroids do play a role but not routinely used in the management of kawasaki disease that's what you should remember okay right okay then one more condition i want you to make a note of i was giving ivag for a child with kawasaki disease but unfortunately the child was not responding to the treatment i will call this as ivig resistant kawasaki disease okay ivig resistant kawasaki disease by definition if the child is not responding even after 36 hours this timeline is important after 36 hours of starting ivig treatment if the fever or the clinical features still occur then it is called ivig resistant kawasaki disease okay now this is a clinical um, scenario which you have to answer what are my treatment options at this time what are the treatment options at this time what I can do is I can give a second dose of IVAG because it is found out that good number of children have responded to second dose of IVAG. The same dose only I am going to use it here, 2 gram per kg as a intravenous infusion. That is what I will be using uh, as one treatment option. Second uh, treatment option would be like giving IVAG along with steroids, along with steroids. And here the steroid is a prednisolone. Prednisolone. Okay, that is a second option which I can have whenever a child is not responding to the usual treatment. Okay. Then third one would be something like another uh, immunomodulator. But this time, I will give you the clue. You can just tell me. It is a monoclonal antibody against TNF alpha. Any comments? This I think most of you should be able to answer. I'll just look for the... Yes. Very good. Very good. Okay, right? Yes. Monoclonal antibodies can be given. What is the name of that? Yes, it is called infliximab. Okay, it is nothing but the infliximab. Okay. Yes, fine. Okay, right. So, this is what it is. Generally, uh, for IVAG resistant Kawasaki disease, I'll give one more dose of IVAG. I can also combine it with the steroid or sometimes if not responding to that also, I can go for infliximab also. Okay, right. So one more time, I would want you to uh, remember the role of steroid. In usual Kawasaki disease, steroid role is not very clear. But in IVAG resistant Kawasaki disease, steroids do have a role. This is how you have to answer if suppose somebody asks you a question about role of steroid in Kawasaki disease. I hope this is clear. Okay, fine. Okay, now the next part is the treatment of Kawasaki disease in the convalescent stage. What is the meaning of convalescent stage? I was telling you convalescent stage means the fever has settled and the features of clinical features of Kawasaki disease have settled. Any treatment I have to give? Any treatment I have to give in the convalescent stage or the recovery stage? Here again, yes, it is not a question of affordability. Uh, steroids generally only for IVG resistant cases we can give. Okay. Yes. Any comment? Yes. Here also, I have to use aspirin, but this time in a lower dose. What is that? Anti-thrombotic dose or an anti-platelet dose of aspirin. Typically, low dose of aspirin. Can anybody tell me how much is that low dose I'm talking about? It is typically 3 to 5 mg per kg per day orally until 6 to 8 weeks of illness because that is roughly the convalescent stage or the uh, recovery stage okay now this dose of aspirin okay i will give it till six to eight weeks if echocardiography is normal throughout that is what you have to remember there are no coronary aneurysm a absolutely normal echocardiography then i will continue the aspirin uh, in the antithrombotic dose for six to eight weeks suppose there are coronary artery abnormalities noted on echocardiography then these patients of course, you know that the risk of later problems can occur. So, for these patients, I have to give long-term treatment if there are coronary artery abnormalities noted on echocardiography. Can anybody tell me what is the long-term treatment? Again, it is aspirin only. But I have to continue the aspirin daily. 
okay right it is almost like lifelong aspirin should be given for these children if they have a echocardiographically proven coronary artery abnormalities okay again the dose will be the same only it is 3 to 5 mg per kg per day orally only now the next thing is in case of a moderate aneurysm or a medium sized aneurysm moderate sized or a medium sized aneurysm what they are saying is a dual antiplatelet can be given can anybody tell me what is a dual antiplatelet one is aspirin can anybody comment what is the next one very good it is clopidogrel okay it is clopidogrel so here in a medium sized aneurysm it is aspirin plus clopidogrel okay fine okay then the next one is something like this if there is a giant aneurysm or a large aneurysm quickly recollect what is the giant or large aneurysm absolute dimension more than or equal to 8 mm or the z score more than or equal to 10 is called giant or large aneurysm here what is the problem i told you it can result in thrombosis it can result in stenosis in later life so what i have to give many say that you also need to add anticoagulants also okay you have to add anticoagulants also anticoagulants also okay and this anticoagulant could be something like our usual oral warfarin or low molecular weight heparin also okay right so this is what you have to remember i will just quickly summarize one more time what is the role of aspirin in kawasaki disease during the acute stage you have to give the aspirin in high doses which is anti inflammatory dose during the convalescent stage give it in the anti thrombotic that is a low dose for 6 to 8 weeks if the echocardiography is normal if the echocardiography is abnormal then you have to give it for a lifelong in case of small aneurysms on echocardiography only aspirin will be enough in case of medium sized aneurysm aspirin plus clopidogrel is recommended if it is a giant aneurysm you also have to add anticoagulants like warfarin or uh, this particular uh, low molecular weight heparin this is what you have to remember okay fine that is okay now is there any role of fibrinolytic therapy for example what is that fibrinolytic therapy i am talking about fibrinolytic therapy yes something like recombinant tissue plasminogen agonist and all right rtpa okay fibrinolytic therapy any comments okay this is not a usual treatment but in case a child with a kawasaki disease who had a large aneurysm presents to the emergency or the intensive care unit with acute coronary thrombosis coronary thrombosis then of course you have to recommend anti thrombolytic therapy okay right sorry thrombolytic therapy or fibrinolytic therapy has to be recommended in case there is an acute presentation with coronary thrombosis okay i hope you are able to follow this these are the different management aspects okay fine now finally coming to some precautions while you are treating a child with kawasaki disease this uh, this is a very potential um, mcq exam topic as well as for your clinical management also yes any comments okay first one i am planning a child on long term aspirin treatment for example the child had a coronary aneurysm and i had planned long term aspirin treatment any precaution i have to take what is the potential problem anybody which strikes your mind whenever we talk about long term aspirin therapy of course it is nothing but the race syndrome very good as of course it is nothing but the race syndrome only uh, which is commonly associated with some viral infections okay especially influenza so that is why when you are planning the child on a long term aspirin treatment you have to give yearly influenza vaccines okay yearly influenza vaccine has to be given for these children okay right this is uh, for the feared association with race syndrome that is what you have to remember second thing comment about live viral vaccine i have written very clearly avoid live viral vaccines after ivag what are the examples of live viral vaccine any comment what are the examples of uh, live viral vaccines very good okay something like mmr mumps measles rubella mmr one more would be like the varicella vaccine these are all the live viral vaccines basically if you give ivag the response to these vaccine in the form of antibody production may not occur that is why i am saying avoid live vaccines after ivag do you know how long this residual effect of ivag will last so till that time you should not give any live viral vaccines it is till 11 months after administering ivag you have to avoid these live vaccine this is an important mcq point for for your competitive exam even clinically also this is very important for you to know okay right so these are some of the precautions i will observe during the treatment of 
Kawasaki disease. This is more for a long-term treatment I'm talking about, especially aspirin I'm talking about. Okay, fine. Okay, now finally coming to the prognosis of Kawasaki disease. Okay, see, I have told you so many dangerous things about Kawasaki disease. Okay, right? Coronary aneurysms, risk of myocardial ischemia, long-term stenosis, all those things. Okay, it is there. But what I want you to remember is generally many children do not have a very dangerous course and most of them recover to normal health only. That is what I want you to remember. In fact, uh, when we talk about CFR, that is a case fatality rate, it is less than 1 percentage. Okay, right? It is less than 1 percent. Okay. So, it's not going to be something like a very dangerous condition, but still we have to keep a note of it because there is a coronary aneurysm which can occur in this particular condition. Okay, right? And it is said that, okay, timely improvement, timely treatment will improve the outcome. That's what. So don't forget, again, one statistical point I want you to remember. What is that? Within 10 days, if you start the treatment with IVAG, the decrease in coronary aneurysm will happen to the range of less than 5% only. That is a point I want you to remember. Okay, fine. Okay, right. Then, uh, very rarely, 1 to 3% of cases, Kawasaki disease can have a recurrence also in 1 to 3% of cases. Okay, right. So this is something about the acute Kawasaki disease. What about a child who has developed a coronary aneurysm? What is the fate of coronary aneurysm? Fortunately, most of the coronary aneurysm, if at all they develop in Kawasaki disease, they are only small coronary aneurysm. And it is generally said that almost 50% of the coronary aneurysms will regress to the normal size. 50% of coronary aneurysms will regress to the normal size because they are usually small aneurysm. But not to forget, giant aneurysm, Okay, unfortunately, if a child has giant aneurysm, then there is a significant risk of thrombosis or stenosis in the later life. And here I want you to answer one more thing. Suppose child in later life had developed a significant stenosis of the coronary arteries. Then what can be planned for that child? Of course, later time only. What can be planned? Of course, you have to plan the CABG. And for CABG, usually the arterial grafts are recommended arterial grafts are recommended okay right in case child goes on to develop a significant stenosis okay right so these are the some important points related to prognosis most cases you will not child will come out in normal health only but very rarely you can have these complications which can occur okay now coming to the summary points of kawasaki disease just a quick recap about whatever i have discussed till this time number one it is the most common childhood vasculitis, especially in Indian children. Now it has become the most common childhood vasculitis. Second point, features evolve over a period of time and not all features are present at the time of presentation or diagnosis. So you have to keep your mind open whenever you see a child with Kawasaki disease, especially you see a child with a fever, unexplained fever and that too long duration fever. Think about Kawasaki as one of the possibilities and usually diagnosis based on clinical features only. Okay, right. Diagnosis usually clinical. What is that clinical? Fever along with 4 out of 5 in the cream mnemonic should be remembered. That is what you should make a note of. Lab investigations are not helping in the diagnosis, but echocardiography helps in the prognosis. Where lab investigation will have a role, that is usually in the incomplete or atypical Kawasaki disease only. Lab investigations will have a usual role. That's what you should remember. And finally, prompt treatment within 10 days of disease onset will decrease the risk of coronary aneurysm considerably. What is the risk if you start treatment? It is less than 5% only and quickly recurrent. In untreated cases, what is the risk of coronary aneurysm? It is 20 to 25%. Okay, right? So this is what you have to remember. So these are the summary points of the Kawasaki disease. Okay. And before I end the topic, I have few quick questions for you as MCQs. You can try to attempt them. Okay. Think about this question and try to tell me the answer. Anybody? Think about this question. I'm looking at the um, your comments. You can answer in the Q&A section, Doctor. Okay. Yes. You can comment your answer in the Q&A section. A five-year-old boy, very good. A five-year-old boy is diagnosed with Kawasaki disease. He develops right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Physical examination reveals tenderness below the right costal margin. What could be the likely association? I have already discussed it. In one of the slides, I have told you these are not typical features of Kawasaki disease, but can occur. What is that? Abdomen condition. I'll just put up that slide again. What is this? Very good. It is nothing but the high drops of the gallbladder. On ultrasound, we can detect. Even clinical presentation would be like tenderness, pain, all those what I've discussed in the question. And I even put a star also telling that it's one of the important manifestations. So answer is very clearly 
high drops of gall bladder association so think about this you are seeing a child with kawasaki disease child has fever in the abdomen and that to right upper quadrant think about the strong association of high drops of the gall bladder possible mcq question also okay next question comment your answers the preferred treatment for patients in convalescent stage of kawasaki diseases any answer preferred treatment for patients in convalescent stage of kawasaki disease i will highlight that important word convalescent stage comment your answer just looking at the answers okay very good very good this is where you should be looking at the wording what is that it is clearly mentioned convalescent stage what did i tell you in convalescent stage you will give aspirin alone and that too in low doses or anti thrombotic or anti platelet dose is what you are going to use aspirin that is what i clearly mentioned i'll just take you back to that slide this was the slide can you see that treatment in convalescent stage only aspirin don't make the mistake of saying it as aspirin and ivag aspirin and ivag is in which stage it is in the acute stage only warfarin and aspirin where will you use only if the child is having coronary artery aneurysms you are going to use warfarin and aspirin and warfarin that too what type of aneurysm is it a small and medium sized aneurysm no it is for a giant coronary artery aneurysm only i will be using warfarin and aspirin okay right then what is the other option tissue plasminogen activator is it for convalescent stage no it is when a child present with acute coronary thrombosis acute coronary thrombosis that is when you have to use this uh, tissue plasminogen activator so all these will not be the answer very clear answer is only aspirin i hope you are able to understand this look at the wording of the question and answer this that is what is the uh, thing one okay right okay yes fine then the next one a child is diagnosed with a kawasaki disease he received one dose of ivag and several doses of aspirin child did not improve clinically even after 36 hours of therapy what should be the next step in the management i am again looking at the answers you are typing yes very good what is this not improving after 36 hours of initial treatment what is that it is nothing but ivig resistant kawasaki disease what should be the answer very good i will repeat one more dose of ivag i will repeat one more dose of ivag okay i will again take you back to that slide this was the slide i was telling you in ivag resistant kawasaki disease what are the treatment options multiple options i told you but first thing itself i have written is second dose ivag that means i will repeat one more dose of ivag that would be the clear answer for this particular question okay right so those were some of the mcqs i wanted to discuss at the conclusion of this particular topic uh, with that we are coming to the conclusion of um, kawasaki disease which is the first nelson based discussion topic so i hope this type of discussion was useful to you we are selecting topics uh, which will be like short discussions but still very important clinical topics not only from your um, I mean MCQ point of view, but also for your residency purpose also, you have to know about this. So that's why we made this discussion. I hope it was useful for you. If there are any suggestions or comments, you can please let us know here. Uh, regarding the availability of this session later, uh, possibly this will be uploaded um, at a later time, maybe in the YouTube platform a little later. Uh, but right now, I strongly advise you this one only whenever a session is planned please take part in the discussion you can have a reading of nelson prior to that also or you can try to recollect the clinical cases which you might have presented related to the discussion also so that it helps you in recollecting and solidifying the facts which you have already learned okay right if i have any suggestions or any particular um, topics uh, for discussion also you can let us know we'll be planning it like mostly on a weekly basis um, like every week and usually these classes will be planned in the evening time so that um, you will be available for that and not to interfere with your routine in the day times okay right yes we are planning more sessions and this is going to be like a series of discussions only okay right one of you are having the question like is long term aspirin needed in dilatation only see long term aspirin is needed only when echocardiography is abnormal doctor Otherwise, if the echocardiography is normal, you can stop aspirin at six to eight weeks after the illness started. Okay, right. So this is what you have to remember. Only if echocardiography is nor abnormal, long-term aspirin is needed. I hope that is clear. Okay, right. Yeah, that is what I was telling you. At a later time, uh, this video will be uploaded to the YouTube platform. You can have a look at it from there also. And those who are subscribers, uh, it will be always available in the 
app uh, platform also anytime you can revisit it okay fine okay yeah some of you are saying hsp is not most common that is what i was clarifying again and again worldwide hsp is the most common childhood vasculitis but in india kawasaki disease is now the most common childhood vasculitis okay fine so i hope um the session uh, is ending on a good note and hope you have gained something out of this session. You can have a look at Kawasaki disease. Uh, everything was based on uh, Nelson textbook of pediatrics only. Hope to see you soon uh, in future with another uh, session of an important topic from Nelson textbook. Thank you and I'm concluding the session. Nelson new edition update is going to be released uh, possibly in this April 2024. April 2024 is the possible release date of um, Nelson's 22nd edition. Okay. Thank you.